today. Uh, I'll just take 10 seconds to thank um, all of our wonderful hosts and the organization that's running all of this. Um, FOSS Backstage is such an amazingly well-run conference. Not, only, not Of course, the people are great, but but having everything done, the streaming situation, the chats, it's super awesome to be here, uh, to be here today with all of you. So today, now we're going to talk about um, putting our mouse on the right, right slide. Practical trademark law for your project. Uh, since most of us here are either leaders or participants in open source projects, this is really about how we, on the project side, not as much on the corporate side, um, think about our, our trademarks and our brands and how what we can do about it, some practical advice. So typically, we, we usually would have a talk about trademark law topics and what the law says, but I'm going to turn that around. If you notice the bullet points here, our number of practical advice is actually more important. So if you're in the corporate world or maybe if you're part of a Linux Foundation major project, the trade the law is is important and you need to do all sorts of things about it. But for most of us, we don't have those resources. Um, and we have also different skills and different abilities. So really the practical side is what I think is most important for us. And there are some things that you probably haven't thought about. So uh, this is also an ask me uh, anything. So I'm going to have time for questions later. But I really want to go through some big picture things that we as project leaders or participants should think about in terms of better managing and promoting our own trademarks, and especially defending them from you know, the little VC uh, startup commercial companies that come along and try and steal your reputation. Uh, so these are the practical bits. Once I get through these, uh, I'll start opening up for questions. I have individual sections on different parts of trademark law in terms of how it actually applies to open source projects, which is different than commercial projects in many places, in some cases. Um, but I want to go to the, there's way too much content for that. Um, so I want to go into the places that people here are interested in. We can go into specific sections to answer questions or take general questions. So here's some practical advice, practical trademark advice for your project. The first one is use consistent trademarks. So many of us know what our software does, and we're so excited about it. And we, we, we call it different names. We might use the old logo. The first thing and the simplest thing to do to help protect your marks is use them consistently. Use the name of your product, the thing that people download, in a consistent way. Capitalize it. Use it in a special font, whatever your, your particular brand is. Um, always use it as an adjective. So the best way to say it is, Download Apache CouchDB software here, because from the trademark law perspective, trademarks are marking a product with a name, with a symbol that people recognize. So a lot of us are pretty sloppy with that, um, which is fine in normal use. But doing these kind of things, including the little TM and the R symbol, if you have a registration, um, those ways are part of, at least in, in many countries, in first to use countries, showing, displaying your trademarks with um, the appropriate symbols and doing them the way that the law intends, which is a little bit clunky sometimes, but OK, um, is a way to build up common law rights. Uh, so even if you haven't registered or you haven't done anything else, in many countries, you will still have rights to your marks as long as someone looking at them could recognize them. Another easy thing here is essentially this is treat your trademarks with respect. So we have licenses. And we have codes of conduct that tell us and tell participants how they can use our software, how they can participate in our communities. Well, do you have a trademark use policy? It's not that hard. There's, there's one online that you can simply copy that's written for open source projects. But treating your trademarks as an important part of your project um, and your community is the first step. Show everybody else that you treat, take it seriously. And that helps other people see that as an important asset to your product and something they should respect. Here's the, this is the hardest question really at the root of it for open source projects is how strong is your organization's reputation in the larger world? So most trademark issues are really solved either through private negotiation or through public shaming. Um, there's a lot of private negotiation that goes on that you never see unless you're in that organization. Um, we've all seen a few places where public shaming has been used. Um, and uh, sure, you know, there have been a handful of trademark cases in open source, but really most of the work is done by 
making the right business case to some potential infringer uh, who's infringing on your marks. And the way you do that is by showing that your space in the open source ecosystem, in the technology ecosystem, is important and that it's your trademark and they need to stop infringing on it. So this is, there are really two parts to this. One is how well known is your organization as your reputation overall, just either your project or the whole, you know, umbrella organization you're with. How well known is it in corporate circles, right? Will corporations and people leading large projects who might be taking your code and then reselling it and using your name, uh, how will they know you or not? The other side of the question is, how well do key developers in your technology area know your project? Because a huge way to make sure that large companies respect your trademarks is if there are contributors to your project get who also work at those companies or work at partner companies, get them to do internal advocacy. Um, the point is that most, the most ways we successfully defend open source trademarks from misuse are through the social and business case aspects. It's not, not really about the law from our perspective. Um, and this, I, I, I admit, this is a, a difficult thing for smaller projects because they don't have the reputation. So at the Apache Software Foundation, I created the position of VP Vice President Brand Management and wrote our trademark policy. And after I had worked with it for a while, I realized I was never concerned about going to court because Apache and a few other organizations have this, the breadth to simply say, if we have to, we can publicly shame someone. We can remove them from our contributors to a project that someone, if, if they are egregiously infringing our trademark, let me be clear, it's, it, this is only a final step. We can remove them from participating in our project. That for me is far more powerful at Apache at a project with that scale than any lawsuit. Um, and it's also from our perspective as open source group, much more practical to do because it doesn't require the legal expertise and the money. So of course, um, a main issue we, we think about when we think about trademarks is uh, what happens when somebody misuses our mark? How do we go about fixing it? They actually, the first question is, how are you going to discover those things? So once some company, and the, the typical case here that I've seen dozens of times is that either a big company sometimes, or usually smaller companies, um, ones that are looking to grow quickly, will either purposefully or unknowingly co-opt an open source project's reputation, their trademarks, their brand, whatever, in their own products, and then try to sell them, effectively competing with you by using your software, which is okay, and also effectively using your trademarks, which is not okay. The trick is correcting these things, both in the overall perspective and in the perspective from the infringer, becomes geometrically or exponentially harder the longer a potential infringement goes on. So is your community around your project, are they active? Would they notice if some new company were trying to capitalize on your brand? Uh, and particularly, in particular, would they know who to report it to? And if they do report it, that, you know, this new VC company that everybody's been talking about them, and all of a sudden they're now running the cloud service that uses your software and uses your name to drive their sales. Uh, we, we might have heard that recently in, in the news. Um, how would you find out about that? And when you do with the community, which is what we really can rely on, let the right people in your organization know so you can say, okay, yes, this is a problem. Yes, we need to address it. And we need to go, uh, you know, get an officer from our organization to start talking with the company, right? Uh, do you have the processes around, do you have a trademark policy? That's back a couple of slides. Do you have the process to how to address infringements? So at the ASF, we have a clear process. We have a volunteer right, VP of brand management who is responsible for this and some volunteers that help them. We have an expert counsel and retainer who we really don't use very often for this. Um, but even in that case, it's still an issue for all of Apache's 200 projects to be effective at collecting these things and bringing them up. So an important structural thing is to think about how would your, how would your organization, how would your project, whatever you have, address misuses of your brands. Um, 
So one of the things we always ask, people always ask about are trademark registrations, are they important? Can I just go trademark something? Uh, the lawyers are now twitching because I said trademark is a verb, it's not a verb. Um, registrations are like an insurance policy. Uh, the issue is that it takes a long time to get your policy actually written. So you, you have a trademark and you can go apply to various national registries. And of course it's different in every country or across the EU. Um, but it takes the, the US PTO, uh, which does trademarks, uh, at least six months, if not longer, to even sort of get around to your application. And if there are questions, then much longer. So you, you can't, you can't, I've seen a number of projects where, oh my goodness, somebody's misusing our brand and it's hard to deal with, oh, let's go make get a registra registration. Well, it's kind of too late at that point. Um, the trick here is if you're a commercial company, you could just go register in a bunch of countries. As open source projects, we don't have those resources. So the trick will be to figure out which countries are really important for your contributor base, i.e. which countries do you want to make sure that you can really protect your trademark um, for people who are going to come to contribute to your project, because that's really the most important thing for open source projects is bringing in new contributors. Um, the good thing about registrations is once you have a registration granted that is actually issued by some country's authority, it's very hard to take that away from you. Very, very hard. So in the small scale, that gives you a really strong defense in the countries you get registered in. That unfortunately does not necessarily legally protect you in other countries. Uh, there certainly are some legal aspects to it, but those really aren't very important. What really is important is that you can continue to use your brand in, in your key countries, and then that your reputation can uh, ensure that people still come find you instead of somebody else. Although again, usually business is, uh, another good thing about registrations that's that's you don't think about is um, businesses usually have lawyers who, who will check registered marks before naming products. So they'll, they'll avoid you to start with, right? It's a, it's a sort of a, a big moat in a number of ways that prevent people from starting to misuse your brand or your trademarks. Um, and so don't go to court uh, as the, the lesson, but so everybody out there, raise your hand if you're, uh, yeah, pretend, pretend, pretend we're all in a room together again, that'd be awesome. Raise your hand if your organization, your open source project has a trademark lawyer on retainer, right? So you actually could call them and they would just talk to you, right? It might take a little while, but. Okay. Now, keep your hand raised if you have the budget to pay that lawyer for a week's worth of work. Do you have you actually got that cash and do you have it budgeted for legal work? Okay. Now, keep your hand up. You can put your hand down if you don't have that. Keep your hand up if you also have the leadership capacity in your organization uh, to manage a lawsuit, right? To work with that lawyer, to gather evidence from your website, from whatever, and whoever's infringing on you that you, you want to sue, gather from their website uh, to address legal questions, right? The lawyer's going to say, can we claim this or not? Can you show us proof? For most of us, if if you think you have to go to court, um, most open source organizations, nonprofits, you've already lost because it's far too expensive um, and far too much of a drain on your uh, organizational leadership to be effective at a trademark lawsuit. Um, so I guess that the, the point is, I really hope it never comes to this point. Um, the good question is, it usually doesn't. Um, if you if you do the practical steps here uh, in this talk, then it takes certainly takes time. And there are a number of cases where we've had private negotiations going on for quite a while with a commercial company that's infringing on one of our marks. Um, but they have all worked out in in admittedly a small case there, right? This is not covering everybody in open source. Um, but that does work because for any any of us who have a reasonable uh, reputation, a reasonable scope of the technologies that our project participates in, uh, if we find the right people in some infringing company to show, sure, you're making money off of this, um, you know, co-opting some open source project's name, right? To, to go sell something. Uh, but the bigger technical question is, that's great for your quarterly sales, but how is the rest of the open source community seeing you? Are other foundations gonna wanna accept your projects? 
are you going to draw in new open source talent? Well, if you're a company that's that's shown to be abusing of other open source, either licenses or trademarks, um, open source talent is a huge, huge question. And people pay attention to that. Um, obviously, everybody coming to FOSS backstage probably already knows that intuitively. But that's an important part um, in large companies thinking about their internal operations. You just need to find the right person inside the company who can tie together the, the technology aspect, the talent aspect, and then the public image aspect of, sure, you might be making money from some sales stream, but you're also attracting a lot of negative publicity if, you're open, if an open source project is complaining publicly. Um, so that's a long-winded way to say, for all the times we sort of start talking about tiny details about trademark law and, you know, should we sue after we send a cease and desist, all that, you don't want to go to court, uh, you know, unless maybe you're a well-funded Linux Foundation project. That's not a place that an open source, nonprofit, community-led group uh, wants to be because, uh, you know, large corporations and large budgets are what will overwhelm that. So those are practical things that we can do, many of which don't involve a lawyer. Right? You, you probably want to get a lawyer to actually file your registration to make the process simpler, but you don't need one. You actually can file yourself in many uh, countries. Um, thinking about how your organization uses your own marks, right? Show that you respect them and ask other people with a policy to respect your trademarks, to respect your brand. You're free to take our code, but don't capitalize on our social and technical capital. Um, making sure your organization has a way to address these things and to detect these things, right? Having an intake form, just like a bug report, for, hey, somebody's misusing our project brand somewhere. Uh, those are all things that a lot of projects haven't really thought about, but those are practical things we can do with limited budget without having to do lawyer use lawyers. Um, that will make a difference later on when an issue comes up. Uh, because the, the other two truisms are, once you find out about something, it's usually kind of late and it's much harder to, it's much harder to fix something if you find out about it later. Um, and the other one is a lot of times we, we don't find out about things um, until it's way, way too late. But I wanna take a break from the big practical aspects. And here is a list, I actually don't have the right chat, but Here's a list of the other topics that I have that are about trademark law in terms of defining legally, more specifically, what trademarks are. Uh, tips, tips on displaying your own marks, being consistent, all those things. There, there are a few simple things that you can do uh, just with your existing website and your existing, existing marketing materials that will get you a, a good way forward. Um, others using your marks, how to detect and what to do if somebody is infringing. Uh, we have a topic on registrations and what they actually mean uh, a little bit, right? That's a that's a huge topic, and it's, of course, worldwide. And uh, little blurbs on misunderstood trademark topics. There are a couple of questions that come up all the time where people are like, I'm like, no, that that that's, has nothing to do with trademarks. Um, but here's a question where I'd like to say, where would we like to go next? So if my moderator back there um, has a, has either a specific question or has one of these topics that people have asked about, um, I can just go through, I have three or four slides for each of the topics that, you know, there's a question on registrations. I'll just go through the reg reg registration section and hopefully that'll answer the question. Thank you so much, Shane. That's great. Uh, very uh, clear, high level introduction to the topic. And uh, yeah, I don't see questions yet in the chat. Uh, I'll keep monitoring that. But as this is a topic close to my heart, I have a few okay, good. started. Uh, I'm going to kick off with um, with Elastic because uh, you know it's been a big trending topic, and uh, I was also tweeting about it uh, in relation to this talk yesterday. So the, the, my, my question specifically is about um, Shay Bannon and Elastic's uh, opinion on trademark enforceability in their case, um, because basically what Elastic have said in in the last two weeks is that they've had to abandon an open source uh, compatible license according to the open source definition because their trademarks were not enforceable against uh, Amazon, at least not yet. And yeah. they didn't go into detail with that. But um, 
that that's against co conventional wisdom, as far as I'm aware. So I wondered what your view was on this on this debate. Uh, okay, I, I don't I don't know that there is a shared conventional wisdom, at least among us who aren't counsel. Um, so I think the the, the biggest question is um, trademarks are about perception. So literally trademarks, the, the, the purpose of trademarks is to protect consumers in, in a, a lot of ways. They're not really protect us as producers. It's to make sure that consumers, when they're going to buy a Ford car that they expect to be reliable or a Coca-Cola that they expect to be sharp, that when they buy a bottle like that, they'll get that flavor and not the sweet flavor of Pepsi. Um, correspondingly, a lot of trademark issues in, in non-famous brands, and certainly in our area, aren't done, aren't solved by going to court. They're solved by bringing up the, the business pressure um, or by being serious enough about appearing to get ready to sue somebody that the other person says, you know, it's not worth my, it's not worth my time and my expense to defend from that. So one thing I, I have not looked in detail about the Elasticsearch thing, um, but I would certainly question what was Elasticsearch doing for their first, how many years was it? Certainly three plus years where Amazon was effectively using Elasticsearch on an Amazon product, right? What was uh, Elasticsearch happy that they were getting extra sales or referrals? Were they happy that they got an Amazon discount? Was there some actual agreement or did they just let it happen? Because the trick is if you let it happen that long, then of course the other company is going to say, we have tons of sunk costs they're gonna fight back until they see a serious um, lawsuit about it. Um, from my perspective, Elasticsearch should have, you know, done something about it within the first year right away. And I think that would have made a big difference, right? It, whether or not um, legally Amazon, they almost, Amazon certainly almost would have been in the wrong if it had been addressed early. Um, but more to the point, a business decision on Amazon's part is this company's gonna make a stink then Amazon would have said early on, great, we'll go make our own thing. We'll, we'll call it our own thing that uses all your software, mm -hmm. right? So they would have forked the code and not the name. And of course, Elastic would still have ended up complaining about this, right? I mean, that's a lot of the big point of people who are having a hard time with, with cloud providers is whether or not you're using the name, they still want to prevent you from actually using the software. So that's actually yep. a, a separate question. It would come up anyways. Um, but in terms of the like the legal aspects of the uh, trademark appropriateness of either Amazon or Elastic, uh, there's a simple answer for that question. It depends. Uh, you know, so if you if you go to a trademark lawyer, that's that's a common joke. Is great. Okay, what what was actually on Amazon's website three years ago? How was it specific? How was Elasticsearch? specifically tied to a product offered in commerce? Yes or no? Did Elasticsearch have registrations at the time, right? Um, had Elasticsearch been treating their mark and had they been actually going out and issuing C and D letters, or at least complaining to other companies, had they been attempting to defend it, right? All those things would, factors would end up going into any lawsuit and they're all complicated. Uh, does that answer? It does, that? thank you. Thank you. I'll move on to my next question, which is um, yeah, a bit more uh, practical then and uh, perhaps uh, uh, more applicable about the use of the symbols. So you referred to these symbols earlier in your talk and we're familiar with them. I wonder uh, when is a good time to start using uh, the TM symbol, for example, because you might only be registering a trademark in one region for your open source project because it's expensive and slow, as you mentioned, or you might not have started using the symbols at all because you might not, uh, for example, uh, have joined the SFLC or you might not have a legal entity established. Is there a limit on when you can start using TM and, and would you advise to use it early uh, or later? So let's be clear, I am not your lawyer. I'm not anybody's lawyer here. Um, I only play a lawyer on the trade, uh, I only play a trademark lawyer on the internet. So um, if you have, start using the TM as soon as you have enough of a web presence to have a consistent name for a specific product you are offering. You can slap TM on anything you want. Uh, there's no real legal penalty. Um, it won't have won't have much meaning until you are being consistent, right? Saying Apache Couch DB TM software, download that here, right? Because you're using CouchDB as a 
as a symbol that means this is the product we're offering to people, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you can do that as, as soon as you want. And uh, obviously in, in most first to use countries, once you start doing that, you can then use that as an intent to use application, or you can, you can just start showing in common law that you have some rights to it. Um, first to file countries probably won't really care, but it's still worth doing because on a practical sense, that shows people looking at your website, oh, they have a real product, right? They're thinking about this, right? Company, even companies will say, oh, if they're claiming it as a trademark, we probably should be careful about it. Right? Mm -hmm. Whether or not they make a business business decision to try and infringe later is separate, but they will probably not. Um, and the, so one thing I, I thought of earlier is um, in terms of registrations, one value, again, trademarks are a lot about perception. So one value of getting an issued registration in uh, most countries, I think almost every country allows this, is once you have that registration issued, right? They have to formally give you the number and all that stuff. You can then stick the R on your website because it is registered. You now it might just be registered in Australia, right? But it's still registered. So the perception there is when, when you say, hey, you, you can't use our, our logo like that, right? You're, you're using it with somebody else's product. You can say, hey, this is our registered trademark, right? When another company or an abuser gets that email, as soon, most managers would forward it up to legal. And as soon as legal sees there's a little R in it, they'll say, yeah, don't do that, right? Because <laughs> the risk to them is so much bigger uh, than not having registration. A registration is sort of like a legal proof that you can pass around saying, yes, you have some rights in this. Now, how strong those rights are in, you know, Russia or India, if you're only registered in Australia, I don't really know, but they will probably make a business decision to not infringe. So getting one registration actually is a big win in terms of you can then use the R. Uh, don't use the R beforehand because you know, people actually could complain about that. I mean, you wouldn't get in trouble, but if there were ever a future lawsuit about it, they would use that as a complaint. Thank you. This one comes from the audience. It speaks to Elastic and MongoDB. Uh, it's going to ask you to speculate. Uh, I warn you in advance. The question is, what's, what's your opinion on whether the strategy of these companies was right from the first to change their licenses later on uh, and presumably blame trademarks as, as a result. Uh, I, I dare say you don't have uh, consulting relationships with those firms, and if you did, it would be confidential anyway, but uh, play the uh, game. No, no I, I do not uh, have a relationship with either firm. I, I do not have stock in either firm either. Um, <laughs> uh, for, well, from a community perspective, they both screwed up, period, right? When you, when you community reputation is all about um, portraying who you are and then staying true to that. And they clearly were trying to be, hey, we're we're running this great thing, but we also want to be open source and have community. Oh, sorry, we're actually changing our license. No, uh, that's just a bad decision. And in terms of the developer uh, feedback and the feedback from other open source organizations, no, it, we're not going to trust them. And that's going to certainly affect who contributes, um, who's interested in, you know, in the next couple of years of, hey, I want to build my next search technology. Should I add this or should I add Lucene or whatever, developers are going to choose somebody else, uh, partly because of that mistrust. Um, in terms of blaming it on trademarks, that's kind of a bold answer, I think. Um, I suppose it might be smart in a way because a lot of people are going to be kind of confused trying to actually analyze what that means, um, but it's not a, not a very good excuse. Um, in any case, right? If they were really thinking about that, then they should have had both better legal and better, you know, brand planning expertise ahead of time. Yeah. Um, so no, uh, in terms of a business decision, I'm not going to speculate on that, but, um, I'm certainly not going to be working with them from my perspective. So. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh, I just want to sneak one additional question here. Oh, okay. um, so you mentioned public image, uh, that aspect, uh, for example, how to communicate the decision to enforce trademarks in an open source project. I wonder if any really good examples come to mind that we might learn from. Uh, 
I'm sure there are a couple. Um, I guess two things is one is if anybody follows, you know, legal people on Twitter, every now and then they post a really funny cease and desist letter, right? Or a really interestingly written decision from a judge, right? That says, you know, fulfills the legal requirement of stop doing this or else, but is done in a humorous and thoughtful way. Those are, are great, both because, you know, then if it go, gets public, it can go viral, but also because the person reading it, right? The people reading these things, when you're complaining about them, they're people too. And they also think about the business part of it. Um, and something else I completely forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess the only other point is uh, when you're addressing uh, an infringement, you're trying to get somebody else to change their behavior around your brand, your trademarks, always start in private, right? Give them a chance to save face. That that solved a ton of things, certainly to patching. And I imagine at smaller cases, smaller companies too, you say, no, really, this is our trademark. Here's how we'd like you to use it or we would like you to not use it. Um, a lot of companies will respect that after it takes them a little while, right? But they will respect it. Another key point is uh, have an officer in your organization send the letter, right? Some random developer sending a letter, if it goes to some manager in the company, you know, whoever the company goes to, they're going to be like, who is this person? I don't really care. If you sign it as vice president brand management, the Apache Software Foundation with the big signature and your logo, then they're like, oh, this is somebody serious, right? Little things like that actually do make a difference in terms of, especially how quickly they'll respond and to a degree, whether or not they will respond, right? I mean, technically some random person doesn't have rights to do this for Apache or for your company or your organization. Um, but, you know, at Apache, we have a, an officer for this and they're the ones who send these notices. That actually makes a difference, right? Uh, we try not, we try to have our hats of, of what we're representing we don't have titles, we're not a hierarchy, but certainly big companies uh, do have hierarchies and they notice them. That's great, thank you. Yeah. So Shane, thank you again for the whole mm -hmm. session.